OK. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Uh, this is Jin Huang at the University of Sydney. Thank you very much for joining this event. So at the very beginning, let's uh, warmly welcome uh, Mr. Craig Ritchie, an Aboriginal man of the Dangati and Biri Pilations and the Chief Executive Officer at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies to give us acknowledgement of country. And Craig, please. Um, Yangan Danang, uh, Danga Nuai, Craig Ritchie, uh, Ngaya Guri Dangari, uh, Dangari Gutunbari Gimbisia Wataya, Bandunga Kai Yalangurku, Ngaya Manatanan Ngunawal Gutundabaria, Ngaya Balor Gakangaran Nganikun Yilan Baria Ditinda, Ngunngun Barain Ngundakam. Uh, in my language, uh, Dangari introduced myself. My name is Craig Ritchie, I'm a Dangari man. Uh, our country, uh, is around Kempsey on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. It stretches from the New England ranges around Walker down to the uh, Pacific coast at uh, Crescent Head along the Maclay River. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you, uh, speaking to you this evening from a uh, notable country here in Canberra uh, and extend that acknowledgement to uh, the traditional owners, uh, Aboriginal First Nations uh, in the rest of Australia and other parts of the world uh, where you are. And I want to acknowledge not just their names, uh, the name of the country that I'm on, but to acknowledge their ongoing custodianship of their country uh, and, and their unceded sovereignty. Um, and it's a pleasure to join you this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Also, thank you very much for everybody, you know, spending the forthcoming one hour and a half with us. So as you see, we have very distinguished speakers around the world. But then let me just briefly you know, tell you about why we decide to organize this interdisciplinary studies. And we believe the repatriating of cultural heritage is a very topical issue. However, the problem is it involves different disciplines for example, conflict of laws, archaeologists, and indigenous studies. And each discipline is self-contained. So we hope this webinar can enhance the communication and exchange of these different disciplines. And at the end, we can see a global effort to have more understandings, um, the joint effort to deal with the challenges of repatriation of cultural heritage. So let me briefly introduce the very distinguished speakers today. So I'm going to go with their, uh, the order of the Australian alphabetical order. We have Professor Jennifer Barrett, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous Academic and Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Indigenous Studies. Uh, at the University of Sydney. Uh, we have Dr. Evelyn Kenfens, who is the member of the International Law Association Cultural Heritage Law Committee based at the Leiden University, the Netherlands, and former director to the Dutch Re uh, Restitution Committee for Lazy Looted Art. And Professor Annie Clark is the chair of archaeology discipline a member of a museum and heritage studies program at the University of Sydney. And Professor Zhen Xinhua is a professor from China University of Political Science and Law. And Professor Charles Tokubai Jr. is a professor from University of Pittsburgh School of Law in the United States, an honorary professor of law from Durham Law School in the United Kingdom. And we also have Craig Ritchie, who I already introduced at the very beginning. Uh, I'm, prof, uh, I'm Associated Professor Jin Huang from Sydney Law School. We have very honored today, we are going to divide our discussion into two parts. And the first part, we are going to invite each speakers to talk about their experience 
and their findings about repatriating of cultural heritage. Very briefly, you know, maximum each professors, you have eight, uh, uh, eight minutes. And then we are going to have 20 to 25 minutes on discussions of three, you know, we jointly decided the topic and we think they have very important, uh, significant, and also we hope that it can enhance the interdisciplinary discussions for the repatriation of cultural heritage. So the presentation and discussion will finish at around 7.15 at Australian time. And then we are going to open up the floor for 15 minutes to QA. But you are free to leave, you know, at 7.15 if you do not have questions, okay? So um, now let me give the floor to uh, Mr. Craig Ritchie. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, and good evening, uh, colleagues. It's uh, just after six here in Australia. Great honor to be with you. I'm gonna share my screen with you um, and uh, what I hope is not death by PowerPoint. Um, and uh, I want to talk to you this evening um, about a um, program that we run here at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies for the Return of Cultural Heritage Program. Uh, just by way of um, background, uh, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, or IATSIS, um, is almost 60 years old. In 2024, we'll be 60 years old. We were established in 1964 as primarily a research institute committed to the uh, research uh, documentation of Aboriginal culture as it was understood in 1964, framed around the now spurious notion that uh, Indigenous people were disappearing from the pages of history. Um, so it was very much a research endeavour and, and a project looking back, um, but um, uh, designed to, as I say, um, capture something of what um, WH Stanner referred to rather pejoratively, and he was very critical of this idea that when you were looking at Indigenous people here in Australia, you were looking at, in some way, the childhood of humanity, that old social Darwinist uh, civilizational progress model. Uh, leaping forward now, uh, we have reoriented to being an Indigenous-led organisation and a very strong focus on articulation, uh, engagement with and articulation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, cultures and story, um, not as a historical curiosity, but as a, a living, breathing, vital, dynamic part of uh, modern Australia, um, and really focused on telling that story. This program, uh, The Return of Cultural Heritage, and I, I, I think I saw Ian's uh, name and some people from our team who are online, began life in the lead up to the, the commemoration in 2020 of the 250th anniversary of our quote unquote discovery um, and uh, of the arrival of that famous coal barge, uh, the Endeavour um, in Kamei. And um, the government here was thinking about different ways that that event could be commemorated or marked. Um, I was um, uh, desperately unhappy with the idea that um, uh, that would be marked by white men with cotton wool wigs firing muskets all around the country, um, but that somehow recognised the impact of that event in terms of the cultures and, and the heritage of First Nations people here. On the 29th of April, when Cook and his men went ashore, 29th of April 1770 went ashore at uh, what became known as Botany Bay. Uh, two things happened. They fired mus musket volleys at the Aboriginal men who were resisting their landing. Um, and then having done that, decided to take objects, spears and uh, shields and so forth. Uh, and so that marked a process of, of violence and theft or um, to put it fairly bluntly, violence and expropriation of, of our uh, embodied cultural heritage. Um, and we argued very strongly and successfully that 
if the government was serious about doing something meaningful, uh, it ought to resource a, a, a concerted investment in reversing that trajectory. So rather than expropriating our cultural heritage, repatriating that cultural heritage. And so we've been involved in, uh, and we created this project, uh, the Return of Cultural Heritage uh, Program. Just to give you a sense of uh, the spread of First Nations, Australian First Nations uh, cultural material, basically we're, 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 we've identi identified around 113,000 or more uh, items of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural heritage located in overseas institutions. The map, uh, the picture gives you an indication of basically the spread of that um, presence. Um, the places we find our material is amazing, I've got to say. Um, and, um, and so we've engaged in this process um, of working in close partnership with First Nations communities here on um, negotiated return of specific items um, and, and predicating our engagement on two things. Uh, relationship, not litigation. And uh, the recognition that our cultural sovereignty uh, was never ceded. That regardless of where our items might be, they still remain within the orbit of, of um, uh, the cultural authority of First Nations people here. And so, uh, uh, and, and that's meant a couple of things. It meant, it's meant that we've focused on places where there was a willingness and an openness to the conversation about return. Um, and that has obviously meant that there are some institutions, some very, very famous institutions that I'm sure we could all name, um, and some places around the world where there was pretty significant legislative in, 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 uh, inhibit, inhibitors to um, deaccession and return of material from, from state institutions. Uh, we have left alone uh, in one respect, but we haven't left alone in another respect. We've continued to build a relationship and, uh, and, and trying to, to create a platform that will uh, engender conversations. Um, and I might come back to that in the question time, because I think there's, there's uh, we, we, we re because we're committed to the ongoing agency of First Nations people and the ongoing cultural authority of First Nations people, regardless of the location of the items, there's still a conversation to be had with institutions like the British Museum, uh, for example, about how First Nations people in Australia can exercise that sovereignty over our material, even while it's in their cabinets or in their, in their vaults, as most of the case will be. Uh, so we pursued um, a, pr a process of relationships. Um, uh, so far, this has resulted in almost 2,000 uh, uh, items of cultural heritage being returned to Australia, and uh, for the most part, returned to the care and custodianship of the community of origin, rather than to an institution here. Although I think there's been a couple of uh, um, possibly a couple of loans coming up. Uh, but that will give you an a, a insight into to where items have uh, come from and um, the communities that have had their, their material uh, return. As I said, our approach is a non-litigious uh, one, it's focused on relationship uh, and focused on helping the institutions uh, engage directly with the community's concern uh, but also arguing very strongly that the process of repatriation and return of materials from overseas institutions ought not be regarded as a loss to that institution, but actually enables that institution to better be what it should be. Um, and uh, in many of the, the, the cases of return, or well, in fact, all of the cases of return, those institutions will tell you they're better museums than they were uh, before the process began. Um, so I wanna talk about very quickly because my eight minutes is well and truly gone. I do apologize. Uh, two particular examples. Um, uh, the first one was a return uh, to the Gungalita Garawa community uh, from the Manchester Museum in the UK. 
Uh, this photograph is the the event. I'm looking rather grumpy there. I don't know why I'm grumpy. I think it's because I'm wearing a tie. I usually wear ties at funerals, job interviews, and at Senate estimates hearings here in uh, in, in Canberra. Um, so uh, here we have a young gentleman who led the um, the, the delegation from Gungalitagara taking delivery from the Manchester Museum of uh, items that had been in the care of that museum um, uh, for, for some time. Um, and we worked to facilitate the link um, and there were other parts of the country that had uh, returns from Man Manchester, Newmall, Aranda, Gungali and Garawa peoples, as I've said, um, and with a potential return of some materials to the Andiliakwa people in the, in the Northern Territory. Um, we linked this work very clearly to the stated goals of the institution. And so we um, uh, worked really hard to foster the relationship. Uh, they will tell you um, that they're a better museum because of that. Um, a second example, these are the Nimal men uh, displaying the artifacts that they uh, received for Manchester back in 2019. Um, it's hard to put into words actually the impact on these communities of having material returned to them. Uh, many of these items are not are not created by their communities to be displayed. They're not items of curiosity. They're, they're, they're ceremonial items. They're items to be used. Um, and I think there's something in this about challenging the notion that First Nations peoples create these objects for the for the idle curiosity of middle class white people in, who love to go to institutions. Um, and it changes the nature of something that's designed to be used in the everyday when we put it behind a, a cabinet or on display. Um, uh, so uh, some further uh, photographs of the, the return uh, from these museums. Uh, this is the return of some, um, that's a Yaru senior cultural leader. Um, and um, so we are in the process um, of finalize some more Aaron de men, lots of photos. My people like to take lots and lots and lots of photos um, in the process of returning these, um, these items um, and some dances at a return event. So um, uh, we have uh, a, some returns in process. We're finalizing returns of material to the Warramunga community around Tennant Creek. They are coming from uh, Auckland and Otago museums in New Zealand. Um, and again, returns built on an acknowledgement of the agency of the communities, us uh, as, a, as a national institution, facilitating the engagement between the community of origin and the, the institution that holds their material, fostering goodwill um, and um, uh, facilitating a conversation that leads to a mutually beneficial outcome. The materials coming back from New Zealand are, consist of boomerangs, adzes, um, selection of stone knives and an ax. And I will say um, that we've had a significant number of returns from private collectors who are easier to deal with for the, main, for the most part than institutions. That's no surprise to anybody. Um, and um, uh, but nevertheless, um, very, very powerful. Um, but I'll also say we're not just limiting our scope of objects to artifacts. One of the things that's unique about, well, perhaps not unique, but one of the things that, that stands out about our community is we've been uh, uh, thoroughly researched by non-Indigenous people over the last 250 odd years. Often the, those research reports, field notes, um, uh, articles, books, are uh, in fact an embodiment of the knowledge of the, of the Indigenous people who were being studied and, and constitute part of our cultural heritage. And so, so we don't just focus on uh, objects and artefacts so much as uh, alone. We, we're interested in archives, we're interested in whatever embodiment of First Nations knowledge and culture is held in overseas institutions and facilitating its return always building that on the sovereignty of indigenous people and in and in many cases or some cases rather surprisingly the community have told us we want our stuff to stay where it is because it has a job to do right alongside 
the cultures of Europe and the rest of the world. And so we respect that. Uh, for the most part, people want their stuff home and, and we respect that as well. But because our foundation is around um, relationship and agency, we, uh, uh, it's important to acknowledge that. Um, in one powerful instance, a community from uh, the Tiwi sent a song man to the Vatican Museum to sing a song to the poles, the, the Pukamani poles that were in the, held in the Vatican Museum and in language. And the song said to them, this is your home now. You have a job to do here for us, be at rest in this place. Now that was, I've got to say, quite a confronting thing. Um, but at the end of the day, they're their poles. Um, and it's the and it's their um, authority that that um, governs them. And so, yeah. whilst that's rare, that does happen. Um, but I'll just I'll close now because I've a said enough, more than enough, and I've also lost my place in my notes. Um, uh, but just emphasise those two things: our approach informed by cultural sovereignty and relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. You know, I promise I will come back to you later. Okay, especially the idea, you know, to create a win-win solution, you know, for the museum or the private collector, you know, on one hand, on the other hand is the indigenous community in Australia. Now let's go to Jennifer. And Jennifer is going to talk about, you know, the experience in University of Sydney of our archives. So let me share the screen. Uh, thank you, Jan, and for the purposes just for keeping things going here in terms of the time, I just wanted to sort of open by just saying Yawayi, uh, and that is hello in Dungari. Um, also, my, I'm from my mother's side of the family, uh, from the Northern Rivers region of, of New South Wales, up around the Maclay, um, Maclay River in Kempsey and the islands uh, in, uh, along that river. And I also just wanted to say, um, to thank uh, Craig for his acknowledgement and acknowledge that I'm a guest on uh, country at the moment. I'm here on Wongul country, part of the Eora nation, sort of further, much further south than, uh, than Dungadi, but also further north uh, from where Craig is at the moment. So with that, I just sort of picking up on what Craig has just mentioned, and if we can go to the next slide, he said that we've we're thoroughly researched as a community, as as, as Aboriginal people, and part that's what I'm going to just focus on for a short uh, for a short while. The University of Sydney has been around since uh, 19 the, uh, at the 1850s, uh, uh, not as long as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in in Australia, but it is uh, the oldest university in this land uh, in terms of a Western notion of uh, of university and. I want to tell you a story about this, these collections and some of this research that's, that's gone on. So the University of Sydney holds the oldest um, Australian academic records documenting First Nations people in Australia and the South Pacific reg region. And these records are recognised by UNESCO uh, and registered on the Australian Memory of the World Register. Uh, there are boxes and boxes of material that take up 50 metres of shelf space in our archives. There are almost uh, 3,000 requests for access to the collection, and we know around 70 of those requests are for materials that directly support native title claims uh, made around the country. Yeah. At the moment, less than 10% of this collection is digitised, uh, which is an important issue uh, on a number of, uh, for a number of reasons. But one of the key things, I guess, in picking up on a couple of uh, two other themes that Craig has mentioned is that that sort of issue around, you know, building uh, relationships and also looking at agency of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in the process of, of um, repatriation is, is really important. So I have a couple of characters here, uh, anthropologists, uh, in particular, the Elkin collection that we have at the University of Sydney um, is significant and makes up a, a significant portion of those uh, 50 metres of shelf space that I just referred to. Now, Professor Elkin was an Anglican clerg clergyman and, uh, and he was also a very influential uh, anthropologist in that he advised government about uh, ways to manage Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, which is also why it's these, you know, getting uh, access to these records, but also making them uh, discoverable for community is really important. 
So we have the next slide, please. So what's really important here for us is that, uh, is that what we start to, to think about as an institution is what's our responsibility as a university in terms of having a collection, in terms of you know, looking at how some of the, the careers of these people who have been major figures in particular discipline have actually uh, had a huge impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So in the context of, uh, of Elkin, we see um, Elkin and also Radcliffe Brown, another key uh, anthropologist, is we see their, their work being used to justify assimilation, but also to justify the establishment of missions along the East Coast and actually in the Northwest of, of Australia. Have the next slide, please. So what's really important for us at the University of Sydney is how do we address this? How do we deal with this, this collection um, of, of materials? These are notes. There's also um, there's, there's notebooks which actually are um, uh, account for some sort of really important information around language. I just want to tell you a story about my personal experience going into the archives. You see one of my colleagues here, Nairi, who works in the archives, is very keen to see this project around digitization and increasing the uh, discoverability and the accessibility of these, these archives for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we have a sort of situation, as I said, where a whole lot of these materials are not digitized, therefore not discoverable. In my first visit to, uh, to not to the archives, but to discuss these, this particular collection, the archives team sort of, you know, uh, you know, brought out a whole lot of material that was from, you know, the area where uh, my, my mother's family is from. And I had, you know, this sort of sense of, oh my goodness, I could see that they, they were, were very well intentioned in terms of what they were trying to do. But I didn't know whether some of that material that was included there was secret, sacred material. I didn't know whether that material was material that I should be seeing, given that I'm an Aboriginal woman. So, so there are a whole lot of cultural sensitivities around this process, which um, this process of this project, which raised some really important sort of issues for me personally. And I also think that it just goes to show that if I'm having that experience as a well-educated person working at the university, how do, what would this mean for community? How do community find out about what's going on here? So part of picking up what Craig was talking about before, the looking at the relationships is really important. So for the archive, team, what we're looking at is the way in which the digitization, the improvement of the digitization project can actually be a way to, to make these, 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 um, these archives accessible to community because they include significant material around language because Elkin was a, a great documenter, a great note taker and had really significant uh, you know, observations of life and uh, in the community. And okay, just he used that to a, a really negative extent, but for community now, they're wanting to and working in, as you heard Craig, the language is really, it, language is really important, language revival, language passing on community, uh, family uh, uh, stories and cultural, cultural stories is really, really important here. And so what we're looking at is the building, not just of uh, a way of making these, uh, these accessible through digitization, but also really key in this process is having an engagement with the community. Uh, so this is really, really important, is that that relationship building is as important as the digitization project, uh, because we need to build trust, because we're an institution that's built its history off the back of knowledge appropriated and used by, um, by the anthropologist. So what you see here, as I said, is, is, um, is a picture of my colleague with uh, a series, uh, all of the boxes that need to be digitized. So the next slide, please. And what you see here is some work that we're doing, which has been really important, and that is working with organisations like IATSIS and other national cultural institutions to network this material into a bigger kind of network of, of information sharing and also building relationships. So we're building relationships with cultural institutions within Australia, but also um, with, with communities. And one, I think one of the other really important things to recognise about the extent to which Elkin uh, was considered, uh, was considered a, um, a significant figure here is that it, during the process of his research in um, particularly in the early 20th century, he collected a lot of material from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and he and also from Papua New Guinea. He traded many objects as well for the purposes of, of picking up antiquities. 
uh, for our Nicholson Museum. So there's a really interesting and just, you know, really uh, complicated and problematic uh, way in which we need to be thinking about this process too. So what records do we have about the trade of those objects that he collected as part of his work uh, as a clergyman, but then also part of his work as a researcher at the University of Sydney? Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So one of the key things for us around um, the notion of repatriation in this project, with this particular project, which is around archives, is to facil facilitate and strengthen cultural safety uh, in, in a culturally safe way, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community access to the university archives. It's important that we generate greater awareness of the collections relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and as I said, link it to national repatriation projects. So not just about objects per, per se, but also to sort of see archives as really intrinsic to understanding how the knowledge that's held within these archives is part of that embodied cultural um, connection that uh, communities communities make. So what we're doing is, is engaging in uh, with archive, uh, sorry, with outreach projects with senior knowledge holders, both on campus and in communities. We're also working very closely uh, with a set of protocols, cultural protocols, uh, on the use and access of these, um, these objects. So our library is also going through a really similar project too. So it's linking up with other collections within the university because they are the, both the collections, the uh, the ethnographic collections and uh, the antiquities that I referred to before, and also our library collections, are all interconnected with what's in our sits in our archives at the moment. So, using university cultural protocols, which are consistent with those that are other cultural organisations like IATSIS, um, is really important, particularly in relation to dealing with secret and sacred material. Strengthening staffing capacity in the archives team is also really important too. So building capacity, having the appropriate cultural um, knowledge holders involved in the workplace, uh, employed, having their knowledge properly uh, remunerated is also really key. And partnering with groups like IATSIS here for the preservation and increased access and agency for communities is really, really important. Um, the last thing I'll say in closing is that um, the work that this work for me has become really important. So I'm in a leadership role in the university as a pro vice chancellor, but what I'm also is an academic a professor of museum and heritage studies. And I also have connections obviously to community both here, but also elsewhere. This has been a great opportunity for me to understand my own agency in this context to to bring about change, to facilitate, um, to facilitate this work. So it's been quite a privilege to work with this material and also I think really important for Australia at the moment because we're going through a context, as said, we're going through a process where I guess, you know, many of us are hoping that we will see a treaty um, sometime soon. And so this project for me is also, and I think for our institution, is about being just that treaty ready. Thanks very much, Jan. Thank you very much, Jennifer. So um, let me stop sharing. Uh, yeah, stop sharing. Okay. So for our global audience, now we are going to move across the globe, you know, move to the Netherlands. Um, Evelyn will go to present the very important work done by the International Law Association Cultural Heritage Committee. So I'm going to see, you know, slightly but uh, complementary concept about the local community and the engagement of land state actors. So Evelyn, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this invitation and for this opportunity. And um, I have shared my screen and uh, yeah, so the topic I want to address is the legal status. So the legal status as a lawyer, the legal status of communities in repatriation procedures. Now, my proposition is that communities deserve a, a central role, but often this is at odds with the legal framework that treats cultural heritage either as state property or as private property. Fortunately, the law is not a, uh, an absolute given. In that respect, allow me uh, to first draw uh, your attention to the report of the International Law Associations Committee on the topic of participation in global cultural heritage governance. The results of five years of work by over 50 scholars and practitioners in the field of cultural heritage law under guidance of its chair, Andrzej Jakubowski and rapporteur, Lukas Ligzinski. 
The report has a wealth of information on global and domestic practices of cultural heritage governance. And for today's uh, topic, I think the most important recommendations are that heritage communities should have a key role in the identification and safeguarding of cultural heritage, and that particip participation should be treated as a right of non-state actors and a duty of states. Now for a progressive development of the law that is promising, but let me now briefly uh, illustrate the complexities of restitution claims on the basis of a case example from my home country. It concerns archeological objects from Crimea that were part of a traveling exhibition in Amsterdam, the moment of the annexation of the peninsula by Russia in 2014. Now the question the Dutch Museum was faced with uh, and that is pending before the Supreme Court at this very moment, is to whom to return the objects to Crimea, where they are considered local heritage, or to the Ukrainian state in Kiev, the state authorities claiming them as national patrimony. An earlier ruling concluded the objects should return to Kiev on the basis of the 1970 UNESCO convention that basically treats states as owners of the cultural heritage on their territories. Not without significance, in the meantime, also Russia declared the object as part of its uh, national patrimony. The legal framework, this is a case that I will not further go into, but it's also a Dutch case which very much uh, exemplifies all the complexities of uh, the legal framework and fragmentation. Um, so there is, we have this fragmented legal reality where um, there are certain blind spots. The UNESCO treaties uh, uh, are uh, today's treaties and they are not retroactive, so they do not apply to earlier losses and they, uh, they operate on the interstate level. So the question is, what about earlier losses and what about other right holders? Uh, ownership then is a matter of national private law. And as we all know, national ownership laws differ widely per jurisdiction. This results in a legal labyrinth for restitution claims and also for an incentive to the illicit trades. On the bright side, an important development is what may be called the humanization of cultural heritage law. In short, this comes down to the acknowledgement of the social function of cultural heritage that is key to the re realization of human rights. Cultural objects in that sense are not perceived merely as possessions, but as tangible symbols of an identity and as right holders, the notion of heritage community uh, was introduced, for example, in the 2005 Faro Convention. Key in a human rights approach to claims, I think, is the right of access to cultural goods as it develops from the right to culture in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Although this may still vague and unspecific, unspecific um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is very specific in its obligations with regards to lost cultural objects. Indigenous peoples in this respect have, for example, the rights to access, use and control their ceremonial objects. And the important thing is that uh, the UNDRIP by now is considered the implementation of the right to culture of the binding international covenants. So to sum up, uh, what we can see here is a focus on the heritage interest of communities whereas rights are not defined in terms of exclusive ownership rights, but in terms of access, control, uh, participation in management and the like, just and fair solutions, uh, uh, these kind of cooperative solutions perhaps also. And um, um, this brings me, has brought me to the notion of a heritage title as a tool to address such interests also in a private law setting. It is based on a continuing cultural link between people and their cultural objects. And that means that not being able to access or control uh, one's lost heritage implicates, may implicate a continuing injustice, remaining separated from these objects with whom they identify. Furthermore, rights are defined in terms of access control, return, 
not in terms of absolute ownership rights. In fact, it merely is a label for rights that already exist or are evolving under international law, as is Alice illustrated in the International Law Association's report that I recommend you to read fully. However, for these, these developing uh, uh, notions, I think a bridge is needed to implement them also in case, cases uh, on the national level, because that's where uh, claims in the end, if they are litigated, uh, uh, end up. And such bridge, I think, may be given by a human rights approach to claims. Now, in conclusion, the point I wanted to make is that source communities deserve access to justice. Yes, of course, it's better to have cooperative uh, procedures and not to have to resolve, to, to, to revolve, to, to go to litigation. However, not all communities are backed up by strong governments and neither regular ownership concepts nor the conventional framework seems particularly suited to address the key issues that are at stake in my opinion. So that was, uh, I hope I stayed within my uh, eight minutes and here I have the link uh, to the uh, International Law Association Cultural Heritage uh, Report uh, of the committee that just came out in June. So uh, once I... more, I advise you all to read that. So I will now stop sharing. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you very much, Evelyn. You know, uh, your timing is perfect. So our audience may see we are moving across from a very peaceful sea, you know, uh, crack. And uh, Jennifer talk about relationship building, talk about the trust. And now we move to confrontations. So as Evelyn's example about the cultural heritage, should we return the relevant cultural heritage to Ukraine or Russia? That's the question. Now we are going to move to Professor Zheng Xinhua. As you know that China is also a country has a tremendous amount of cultural heritage or items and they were taken, looted abroad. So Professor Huo, we are going to share a case actually talking about the confrontation between China, uh, a Dutch private collector, you know. So we hope, you know, this can give us some insights about the litigation. So Professor Huang, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Huang. Uh, it's my pleasure to attend the event and to uh, discuss with the distinguished international colleagues. So today I will focus on one particular case. Actually, Evelyn mentioned this case from the Dutch uh, side, and I will try to analyze this case from the Chinese side. Well, you, as, 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 as Professor Huang mentioned, that China has a lot of uh, culture prop property lost overseas. And this case is very uh, interesting, I think. Uh, and this is the object of the cultural heritage that we are talking now. It is a Buddha statue. However, a CT scan shows that there is a remains of mummified monk inside this Buddha statue. And then the story just is about this Buddha statue. Uh, on December 4th, uh, 2020, the Sanming Intermediate People's Court of China's Fujian province rendered a judgment ordering the Dutch defendants to return uh, this Buddha statute. In Chinese, it is called Zhang Gong Zu Shi to its original owners, the two village committees in the Fujian province. And then this year, in July, the uh, High People's Court of Fujian province uphold the first instance judgment and uh, which asked Dutch collector should return the Buddha statute to the, to the local uh, village committees. As you know, that the second uh, ru ruling is, 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 is the binding ruling according to Chinese law. Therefore, it, is, it, it means the end of Chinese lawsuit. This is the first time in history that a Chinese court sees the jurisdiction over a case filed by Chinese plaintiffs to repatriate a stolen cultural property illicitly exported. Therefore, this judgment has brought immediate tension both in China and in foreign jurisdictions. So first of all, let's see what happened around this Buddha statute. Uh, a Dutch architect, a, a Dutch holder purchased this Buddha statute in 1996 from another Dutch in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And he's, you know, 
uh, the actually the Buddha statue was lost in Fujian province by Hong Kong. In 2014, this Dutch holder loaned the statue to Trans Museum in Assen for an exhibition, Mummy World, which traveled to Hungarian Nat Natural Historical Museum in spring of 2015. And press reporting on this exhibition alerted the local Chinese villagers. And based upon the photographs from Hungarian and the archive materials in China, the Chinese villagers believe that this is the one that used to be worshipped by the local villagers. And then uh, it was lost in, the, in December 1995, almost uh, 20 years ago. After unsuccessful negotiations, the two Chinese local villages committees sue these Dutch holders and demand the status return to both in the Chinese court and in the court in Amsterdam at the end of 2015. So I should say that these cases illustrate that there are a lot of important and complex legal issues in the lawsuits around the repatriation of a stolen cultural property. These issues include jurisdiction, standing to sue, classification, applicable law, recognition enforcement of foreign judgment. With regard to jurisdiction, as you know, usually it is this kind of lawsuit is brought in the uh, court where the cultural property is located at, at now, uh, at, the present, uh, at, at present day. So usually we, we believe that uh, uh, with regard to this case, the Dutch court is more uh, suitable to exercise the jurisdiction. However, the jurisdiction of the Chinese court in Fujian province is not easy to understand. To understand. And the second issue is the standing to sue. As we know that before the Dutch court, the plaintiffs are the two local Chinese village committees. However, these villages committee were established pursuant to the Chinese law, which is completely unknown to Dutch judges. Therefore, whether the Dutch judges should would recognize the standing of a Chinese villages committee, I think is a matter of un uncertainty. Uh, and then the third issue is the classification. That is, to, that is to say, what is the nature of the statue of Zhang Gong Zhu Shi? Property or corpse? This is also a very important yet difficult question, especially for the Dutch judges. If the statue is classified as corpse, the Dutch collector is not entitled to ownership as no one can own a identified corpse on the Dutch law. Therefore, that statue should return to the local families or their descendants. However, if it is classified as property, it is possible for the Dutch holder to assert ownership. And the, the fourth issue is the ethnic law. That is to say, which law governs the issue? The Chinese law or the Dutch law or the law of Hong Kong? That is a very important issue. And in this field, the private international law recognized the principle of the lex rate citus. However, the problem is how to interpret the meaning of the lex rei citus is also a complex issue. And last issue, I think, is the recognition enforcement of foreign judgment. Well, if the Dutch holder, if, if the Dutch court render decision, I think that the judgment can be re recognized easily. However, if it is a Chinese court that demands the Dutch holder to return the statue to China, I think the recognition enforcement is a big problem. Uh, well, as with regard to this issue, at the end of uh, 2018, the Amsterdam District Court make a decision, and in one chapter in the legal battle over the statute, but failed to resolve the controversial situation uh, to enumerate the past forward the, the parties. And the Dutch court did not decide anything about ownership of the parties. It simply determined not to hear the case based upon its finding that the two Chinese village committees did not have the standing to sue before a Dutch court. So I think, I, I think it's pity because the Dutch court did not, you know, make any decision on the merits of the issue. So let me introduce the development in the in China. The first issue is whether the Chinese court has the jurisdiction over the issue. Well, in the very beginning, I personally believe that.
Sorry, can everybody hear us? Uh, Stacy? No, we can't hear at the moment. What? What's the problem? Um, uh, did he uh, apparently mute himself? Um, yeah, he's on mute at the moment. Okay, you. Yep, that works. Okay. Well, you just did it again. <laughs> yeah, you mute everybody, including me. <laughs> now oh, it's okay. <laughs> yes, yes, now we can hear you. Okay, let me continue. So you can see that if, if only the, the, one of the following conditions are satisfied, then the Chinese court may exercise jurisdiction. First, the property is located in China. Second, defendant has discharged property in China. Third, the tort was committed in China. And fourth, the defendants have its representative office in China. However, in this case, I believe that it's quite difficult to argue that the Chinese court has the jurisdiction on Article 272 of the CPL because the statute is not located in China now, nor did defendants steal it or purchase it in China, nor do they have this tangible property or representative office in China. However, unexpectedly, the Chinese court sees the jurisdiction pursuant to the uh, propagate, uh, prorogated jurisdiction under the Chinese superstition law regime. Prorogated jurisdiction of the Chinese superstition law refers to a situation where one party institutes proceedings in a court and the other party implicitly acquiesces to the jurisdiction of that court by responding to the action and not ra raising an objection to the jurisdiction. Or in other words, the defendant's failure to object constitutes defendant's consent to the people's court in China. People's court jurisdiction, uh, sorry. And then we can find that in this case, the Dutch defendant did not raise an objection to the, to the jurisdiction of the Chinese court. Instead, we have responded to the lawsuit by submitting a written statement of defense representatives by two Chinese lawyers to surprise of many observers. So in this case, the jurisdiction of Chinese court was established under the prorogated jurisdiction of the Chinese superstition law in an unexpected manner. So to, to surprise of many people, including myself. And another important issue is that which law governs? As we know that the Chinese court, when it determines which law governs, they apply, they use the Article 37 of the private international law of China. Let's look at this article. This article provides that the parties may choose the law applicable to the real rights in a movable property. In the absence of that choice, the lexitus at the time that the legal, of legal fact occurred applies. However, before this case, the Chinese court never clarified the meaning that, what was the meaning of the lexitus at the time the legal effect occurs? And so the, the interpretation of Article 37, it, it becomes the, the key issue. And in this case, the court highlight two conventions to which China is contracting party. That is the UNESCO Convention of 1970 and the Unidroid Convention of 1995. As both these conventions are devoting to prohibiting the illicit traffic of cultural property and facilitating the return of cultural property to its or originations, the Chinese court concluded that it should interpret the lex racitas at a time when the legal effect occurred in the light of their objective and the purpose. And with regard to the meaning of the time, when legal effect, legal effect occurred, the Chinese court stated that it pointed to the time when the statute was stolen rather than the time when the Dutch collector purchased it in Amsterdam. And then summarized the conclusion, the judge stressed that the statute is a cultural property of great historical and religious significance in state of ordinary property. As illicit traffic of cultural property usually creates a number of legal facts, which inevitably leads to the proliferation of luxury status, including the location of property that had been stolen, the place of the, its first transaction, the place of last transaction, the place of exhibition, location of cultural property. At the time of, of litigation, the judge emphasized the need to spell out the luxury status at the time when the legal effect occurred 
for the cases of recovering cultural property. And then the court concluded that the lex recitus at a time when legal effect occurred should be understood as the lex futi, that is to say the law of location of cultural property when it was stolen. Because this kind of interpretation favors the protection of cultural heritage and facilitates the return of cultural property illicitly trafficked. Whereas the case of transaction not only favors the laundering of the cultural property, but also adds considerable uncertainty to the question of title. And then the Chinese court referred to the property law of China under which the bona fide acquisition does not apply to stolen cultural property. Consequently, the court ruled that the Chinese village committees retained the title of statute and demanded the Dutch defendants to return to its plaintiffs. And then, you know, as I say that this year, the Fujian Provincial High People's Court ruled at the second stand, uh, 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 stance to uphold the first instance judgment. That's the end of the Chinese lawsuit. Well, concluding remarks. At the present stage, I think that it's still quite unclear whether the Dutch defendants would comply with the Chinese judgment or they would simply ignore it. Though I do hope that the Dutch defendants will return the statute to China as ordered by Chinese court. However, I'm afraid that ignoring the Chinese judgment may be one of the reasonable options because there are many obstacles to recognize and enforce the Chinese judgment in the Netherlands. Well, in spite of the uncertainty ahead, I think that nobody can, under, can overestimate the significance of this judgment. It is the first time that the Chinese court exercised jurisdiction over a case to recover a Chinese culture property stolen and illicitly exported. So I think that it is a historical event, no matter whether the judgment will be enforced or not in the future. And then I believe that another important issue is that the court um, professor, it, professor, maybe you need to wrap up. Yeah, so the, last, the last page, yeah. It is the first time that the Chinese court interprets the meaning of Lex Recitus. So according to this interpretation, it seems that uh, uh, when Chinese judge, uh, the uh, judge uh, uh, hear these kind of cases, no matter where the culture property is located now, Chinese law should govern. So given the large number of Chinese cultural properties stolen and illicitly export abroad, I believe that impact of the judgment is tremendous. And thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, you know, Professor Huo. So actually in this year, the United States Supreme Court also hear a case on cultural heritage, especially on the issue of sovereign immunity. Now let's turn to Charles. Um, the floor is yours, Charles. So we are going to, you know, very strictly stay on the seven minute, uh, eight minutes requirement. Okay. Uh, you are mute. Um, so I don't have slides here. So everyone's going to be stuck looking at me while I speak. And uh, I will be very brief here. Um, I, I will say right at the outset, I'm not an expert in the repatriation of cultural heritage, unlike the others on this panel. Uh, I'm a disputes lawyer. I'm an international disputes lawyer. I've spent you know, most of my career repatriating, recovering things like airplanes, oil, gold, and, and usually money. Uh, and as a professor of international law, I usually deal with disputes against states. Uh, the law regarding looted art, however, falls really within this paradigm. It's a valuable asset that's usually stolen by a state or a state actor, usually during a time of crisis or conflict, uh, monetized and moved across borders. The legal obstacles and pitfalls are similar um, in these sorts of cases as they are in a lot of other cases. So here, I'm really going to try to give a snapshot of where the law is in the United States, especially as it relates to Holocaust era art, because those are the cases that usually come to US courts. And I'm not going to go deeply into these cases. I'm really going to give just a snapshot of where the law is and how it's developed over the past 20 years. And let's take the easiest example, um, Nazi looted art held in the US by private parties who unwittingly come into possession of it without their fault. The law is increasingly on the side of the original owners in these situations. Uh, the weight of the US government is often employed. There's a special FBI field office called the Art 
crime scene. There has been dozens of examples over the past 10 years where the FBI and the Department of Justice have recovered Holocaust era art on a legal basis that it's stolen property that has traveled in interstate commerce. And in 2016, the US enacted the Holocaust Era Recovery Art Act, which ensures that these sorts of claims aren't barred by the statute of limitations. Again, this is a benefit to the original owners to recover the assets. The calculus changes, however, I think under US law when a state or a state entity is involved. And this is common. Oftentimes the art has come into possession of state collections and loaned into the United States and there the recovery hits the wall of sovereign immunity. And here things get tougher under US law, which is generally deferential to sovereigns. Um, also in 2016, Congress enacted the Foreign Cultural Exchange Community Clarification Act. It's a very long, long title, but it generally strengthened uh, US immunity rules for art that was transiting through the United States on loan, um, but it exempted a lot of the Holocaust era art as I'll get to in a minute. So really, I just want to focus in the, in, the, in the few minutes I have left on three cases, three basic cases, and I want to talk about uh, just, just their essence, and I'm not going to go into detail on them, over the past 20 years. And they have been three cases over the past 20 years before the U.S. Supreme Court regard, regarding Holocaust-era art. The first one was Altman versus Austria. This was the subject of a famous movie from 2015 called The Woman in Gold. It was a legal action filed by uh, the heirs of the rightful owner of rightful owners of six Gustav Klimt paintings that were seized by the Nazis during World War II. Uh, because the filing fees were really high in Austria, the, uh, the, the heirs who lived in California filed suit there and the case proceeded. And Austria raised the defense of sovereign immunity, um, arguing specifically that in the 1940s, when, 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 the, when this art was taken, uh, the US law in the United States was, was absolute. The sovereign has absolute immunity, even though that had changed throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, in the 40s when it was taken, the law was absolute, and the U.S. Supreme Court disagreed with the government. Um, it held that uh, the restrictive immunity, the, the, the looser form of immunity that was in effect now applied to the, to the situation that had happened back in the 1940s. And this was an essentially a very pro-plaintiff decision. It allowed um, um, heirs and owners of, of, of Nazi looted art to come to the United States. And if an exception to immunity could be pled and proven, and that's always a big if, cases would proceed in the United States, notwithstanding um, sovereign immunity. And it, what's really interesting, what I get to at the very end here is what happened here is after this decision, after this decision, um, the government of Austria decided to go to arbitration over these six um, paintings, um, something they had refused for years earlier. And the arbitrators held that five of the six paintings in question should be returned to the heirs. So the situation where the mere threat of litigation, the mere threat of liability, uh, pushed the parties towards a more civilized process of arbitration. Uh, the second case is about uh, five or six years old is Phillips versus Germany. It regards the, uh, the wealth and shots case, uh, it was a, uh, regarding a collection of medieval relics that were purchased under duress uh, by the Nazis from, uh, from um, German Jews during the Holocaust and uh, then held by the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, which was an arm of the German government. Uh, the question in the US courts was whether an exception to sovereign immunity existed to recover this art, um, whether a, an exception existed on the basis that the property was taken in violation of international law. Now, this raised a very difficult question under international law as to whether a taking of one state of the property of its own citizen can constitute a taking under international law. Um, the, the Supreme Court held that it couldn't. Uh, the, the exception of immunity for these plaintiffs, but a, a, a caveat, a caveat, a carve out was, was, was recognized in this case um, for Holocaust era victims, for, for, for German Jews and, and I think Hungarian Jews in later cases as well. It was basically decided that um, at the time the property is taken, they didn't have all the, all the benefits of being citizens of their respective states. So the taking there was in fact in violation of international law. Um, this has continued forth and allowed this expropriation exception to still be litigated, which brings us to the case that was just decided a few minutes, uh, a few few months ago, Katsir 
versus Spain. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details, but the question was um, whether uh, states deserve special conflict of law rules when they come to the United States. And the, and the decision in the Supreme Court held that, that, that they don't, that they don't deserve special conflict of law rules. They are litigated. Once an exception to immunity is found, they, are litig they do litigate um, just as private citizens um, being sued in U.S. court once the immunity is stripped away. Um, I, 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 I see I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much for Charles, you know. Uh, now let's move to our last speaker, Annie. Uh, Annie, now floor is yours. Annie, you are mute. Any, you are mute. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I was just organizing my PowerPoint. Okay, I'm not mute now. Um, all right, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'll acknowledge that I'm bringing talk to you from um, Gadigal land. Um, but importantly, what I want to do is actually um, acknowledge the Anindiliagua speaking peoples of the Groot Island um, archipelago, where I've worked for the last 32 years. Um, Normally I'd show photographs of people in this um, PowerPoint working with me on the archeology span and on the repatriation project, but unfortunately and very sadly, um, somebody who I've known for actually half my life, um, since she was a young woman, passed away very recently and a uh, close family member for me, and I'm not able to show those photos. So um, I'm going to talk today about the Grood Island Archeology span Repatriation Project, which um, occurred between 2018 and 2019, interrupted by COVID. And um, now we're back uh, working with community, um, developing a, a, an extension of this project. And um, Professor Barrett is actually part of that um, research team. So I'm just gonna cover that, this in um, uh, a little bit of detail. So um, I was invited, uh, it's, a, it's a longer story, which I don't have time to tell here, but I was invited by the Anindiliago Land Council to return to Groot Island uh, in 2018 and 19 to repatriate all the materials from archaeological excavations together with photographs and other archives from work I did across the 1990s. Um, it was two, uh, uh, basically my PhD and postdoctoral research project. I initiated, in fact, one of the first people in Australia really to do what was now become quite commonplace, but at the time was uh, quite innovative. So community led archaeology where I worked very closely with the community um, to develop the research, the places we looked at, the places we excavated with um, the co community co-researchers. Um, and again, I'd just like to acknowledge that the Land Council funded the project uh, in 2018 and 2019. So I patriated my research material. So this is my, was my messy office here at Sydney University um, in 2018, and that I packed it all up. Uh, into boxes, and there were like 70 boxes of material, uh, archaeological samples, um, the photographs, and, and a whole other issue, but and, and the archives and all the records that go with um, doing this kind of work. Um, shipped them to Groot Island in the Northern, it's a, a small island in the Northern Territory, should I just say, for those of you who are from overseas, um, on a barge. Then we, we put them into um, an office at the uh, one of the local indigenous communities uh, and set up a small archaeological laboratory. Now, normally I'd show heaps of photographs of me working with family members to um, sort of uh, sort and analyze this material, but uh, um, that the one of the people who's in all the photographs is the person um, that recently passed away. So we did all this work together and I and because I'd worked with um, I worked with four sisters. And I'd worked previously with their with their parents when they were young women. Um, their parents have subsequently passed away. And so in a sense, um, it's been a kind of multi-generational project now because I've worked there for so long. Uh, and so I worked with the grand with, their, with the children of those, the people that I've originally worked with. Um, and now um, I work with the children and the grandchildren. And we've actually done 
uh, field trips where we've had four generations, including the, the grandchildren on the project. One of the things I think that was a very powerful part of the repatriation pro project, and of course, when I did the work in the 90, early 1990s, mm. uh, we were still using slide film uh, and um, uh, so analog, analog film. Uh, now, of course, it's all digital. But in, the, in those days, people actually didn't really have uh, many photographs of family members. And I was one of the few people who'd been We'd spent quite a lot of time out in the country, out with out in country with people. And so I've got lots of photographs of people and places. And so one of the things I was able to do was um, return photographs, people re return photographs rather of um, uh, people that I've worked with, family members. Uh, and I made little photo books for everyone. I don't know, I, I, I probably reproduced uh, a thousand copies of photographs and spread them around the community. Um, and then, you know, and this engendered a huge amount of conversation in terms of uh, people coming and asking me if I had pictures of their, of other relatives of theirs. And so, you know, it was a really, I think, quite a powerful way of uh, starting to um, repatriate some of the information and cultural knowledge and materials that I've um, been privileged enough to work on um, as part of the research that I, I've been doing. But in, it's also about, you know, I guess, uh, repatriating those research materials and records um, back to country where people can make decisions themselves about what they want to do long term with all of those materials and that's something that is an ongoing uh, conversation and then in 2019 the sort of extension second extension of this repatriation project um, was to do some field work and again, this was actually basically taking traditional owners back to places that I'd worked with with their parents. It's the, uh, in Aboriginal English, it's called old people. Um, and places that we'd only got one or two photographs of, places where people hadn't gone back to because they're quite hard to access now. Um, and we also, um, so we revisited these sites with people. We took them in by helicopter to places that were very hard to get into. Um, we walked people into sites that I'd worked with with their parents. And it, again, it engendered an inc incredible sort of conversations around heritage, around what the sites mean to people today, but also um, it, kind of the, the memories that that, that, in, that process engendered of, um, their, of their parents and grandparents. And that was a kind of very, uh, I think, very moving and very important part of that repatriation project. So. Uh, a lot of the sites have amazing rock art in them. Again, I'm, I'm not showing that those because I've got people in the photographs. Uh, but it it really was a a, a, quest, a, a process that um, became a process of kind of re rememorizing and rethinking and commemorating these these places that today people are really not um, visiting so much because they're in quite uh, remote areas of the landscape. And so as well as uh, taking people back onto site and re-photographing, we also were doing survey again with the next generation who are again keen to do this kind of work in, in going going forward into the future. And so now we've um, started a or starting to develop a new project um, using a different theoretical framework, I guess, of co-creational co-design to um, work with the land council um, identified community traditional owners, people who the uh, different clans on Grid Island want to work on these projects, um, not just to repatriate um, sort of the archaeological materials and, and the knowledge that um, was passed to me that I'm now um, handing back in um, different kind of formats, but also to start um, identifying uh, archives, photographs, objects um, that are in the museums around the world, um, and going th and using a, a, a community directed approach to how that material comes back onto Ireland first in digital digital form. Um, there's a community process that's been um, identified where elders. Any will... um, yes. please wrap up very soon. Okay, please sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm nearly done. Okay, and so anyway, we're doing this project. There's lots of people involved. It's a multidisciplinary project. Um, and uh, it's aim, the aims of it are to deal with, uh, to aid the land council in their long-term strategic plan. So, yeah, sorry, I, I've only had a few minutes, but there you go. Okay, thank you so much, Annie. 
Um, so far, you know, actually all the questions we did receive from the chat, it seemed that, you know, uh, most of we already resolved. There is only one question actually for any. But before we go to the QA, you know, let's just briefly, you know, discuss some issues that the panelists identified. So actually one issue is about who is the owner of the cultural heritage. So uh, let me go to Amy. Um, would you please briefly, you know, for our international audience, um, explain the meaning of First Nation traditional owners in Australian concept? Uh, I don't know that I'm totally the most appropriate person in the room to do that. Um, I, I might, can I throw that one to Craig and Jennifer as um, First Nations people who are in, in the room? Because I don't think that's my role to... Um, kind of define that really. Um, did you want, did Craig or Jennifer want to say uh, what that means? I mean, first I would have thought, uh, no? You are mute. Put my microphone down. Uh, we couldn't unmute ourselves just there That's from right. there, which um, Jennifer is <laughs> um, probably wise. I don't know. Um, the, the, the phrase traditional owners is a bit of a vexed one. It's one that's used very common and it has its, I think for me, has its origins in the decisions, the Mabo decision and the native title world and has sort then sort of bled into a whole range of other um, other domains perhaps. Uh, because um, you know, I'm, I'm as, as an Aboriginal person, I'm, I'm, I'm a traditional owner in Kempsey in, in, in so much as, you know, I'm part of the families that are encompassed by the native title decision in Kempsey uh, back in the 90s, I think it was shortly, the first mainland uh, native title claim, actually. Um, but in this space, uh, it's not a word that we use. We, it's um, so I use the phrase cultural sovereignty, cultural authority. It's the it's the group of people who have an exercise authority in relation to cultural material, um, and you know, that's often traditional owners, right? Um, but but because traditional owner it has a legal relevance to native title it can be a bit confusing but that's the that's how you know I don't Jennifer if you want to comment a bit more someone will have to unmute yeah, someone someone's unmuted me I think there are a lot of people I know who would love to have this function of <laughs> yes <laughs> so, most of um, my staff to be honest would love to have, be able to do it for me so, so Craig, this is uh, this is a really good question. So, there's a question also in the chat um, from from uh, Sue Ellen Jonas's, and apologies if I've mispronounced her name, which is about you know, as she says here, do you value the knowledge held by traditional custodians who may have been marginalised by people in their local land council? Now, Craig, you've just referred to you know the issues around native title, and I think, um, and, and I think that one of the things I was trying to illuminate with our project is we've got archives relating to um, the dispossession of land, which is therefore means that community, the members of the community are not all connected to, right. to countries in the way or to their traditional, what you might call traditional lands in, in terms of where their family is from. Um, so that's part of the problem here is the legacy of colonialism means that um, those connections were severed because um, because it fitted an assimilationist policy for um, you know um, you know so called breeding out um, Aboriginality in Australia. So so it is it is vexed and also I think the other thing that what what you see is that there are therefore community organisations that are connected to culture through uh, so sorry, sorry communities and individuals connected to culture through different kinds of um, organizations not just land councils for instance so that raises another challenge for us legally too in terms of uh demonstrating connection to country uh and and also connection to culture uh again that's why repatriating this material sort of sharing uh knowledge amongst different communities and making this publicly accessible where it's culturally appropriate is really important um so yeah thanks thanks craig 
And thanks, Annie, for that talk. Mm. Uh, Evelyn, so I think in your work, you discuss a lot about the local communities. So would you please, you know, talking the concept of local community like in Europe, um, what does it mean or also in your research, you know, um, the meaning of local community, yes. Can you, uh, you are mute. You are still on mute. Okay. You kind of unmute. Yes, it's very difficult. It's going on and off. Well, here I am. <laughs> yes. So, um, well, to be honest, I, um, uh, ownership of communities has not been the focus of my research. But anyway, I think that uh, I can address this point perhaps a bit. Is that in 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 the sense that. Um, uh, the problem with these cases, these restitution cases, is that it's in an international setting. So where all uh, legal systems and all jurisdictions have their own or all cultures have their uh, protective rules for their own cultural heritage. These, for example, under Roman law, you have the uh, res sacre and uh, certain objects that are sacred or have a special symbolic value are uh, inalienable, so they're at res extra commercium. And this you see in each culture and in each jurisdiction, I think. Problematic, of course, is that these objects, they, they, where they're in, from an area where they're protected, once they're uh, transferred abroad, they're seen as a commodity. Like you see with the Chinese Buddha statue, for example, you see that in the Dutch court, is having these two parties, the Dutch new possessor who said it was in good faith and under Dutch civil law system, uh, the good faith acquisition is after a very short time, uh, your protectives as a legal owner. Uh, whereas um, the uh, Chinese community ownership title is very foreign to a Dutch court. And this you see in many occasions and in many in these, these litigated cases, there is a case in France as well, where the French judge just doesn't uh, recognize this collective ownership of a, uh, the, in that case, it was the Hopi uh, uh, First Nations in the United States. And they said, we do not know that concept of property. So therefore, I think it's so important to come to a kind of more universal and international uh, inclusive uh, notion of ownership and therefore I think that you we need that bridge. I hope that I somehow uh, answer the point. Yes, thank you so much Evelyn. So I guess my next question also is the last question is um, actually we you know from what the cracks you know, present as good offense negotiation to return of cultural heritage. We also see there are very different approach, you know, like a litigation and uh, also other approach. So Charles, I think in your research, you mentioned about the arbitration, you know, as a way to return cultural heritage. So would you please briefly talk about that? Yeah, uh, thank you. We're, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, you know, in, in, in my practice, anytime a client comes to me and says, I have a claim against a foreign sovereign, um, litigation is usually the very last thing that I recommend because of the, the, the real politic of co-equal sovereigns. It makes it very, very difficult. Um, arbitration is becoming more routine. Look at the Altman case when a state realizes that they are potentially subject to, to liability to a decision that they have stolen cultural heritage, uh, they are willing to engage in arbitration. It's a, it's a more flexible uh, time and cost efficient way to decide these issues. And it internalizes the issue within the, within the, the community, the art community and the cultural heritage community in a way that open litigation in court doesn't tend to do. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is, there have been articles written recently about using investment treaty protections for these sorts of cases. Um, there are thousands, 4,000 investment treaties out there with state-to-state -state arbitration mechanisms um, that could potentially be used for cultural heritage cases. Um, this is a, 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 a way to elevate these disputes out of the local courts, which I think is a benefit to everyone. 
Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. Um, you know, to wrap up, I just want uh, each panelist, you know, you can use very briefly one sentence to talk about if we look into the future, what's the biggest challenge? Um, you know, uh, also briefly, you know, for the future, do you think there will be more barriers or more opportunities for a coordinate global repatriation of cultural heritage? So maybe let's start with Craig. Um, in one sentence, I, I have some optimism that there has actually been a, a global shift in disposition. Um, at least that's what we've picked up in the work that we've been doing. And so we're trying to lean into that 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 um, global shift. Um, and certainly there's um, negatives and, and sort of apprehension, but um, I, I feel quite positive about the way in which things seem to be moving, at least in the work that we're doing. Thank you. And uh, Jennifer? Um, thank you. This, the, I think that that notion of nations being accountable for their past and learning about how to be uh, culturally appropriate in their negotiations with, for instance, First Nations people is really key. I too feel positive about the future, but I also think that um, you, yeah, we do so, still have some way to go with this, not just uh, nationally, but internationally. I also do think that it's important we understand that not all repatriations are equal in that sense. We've got a very multi-tiered um, sort of discussion happening here that's where we're looking at, you know, consequences of, of objects and, you know, culture being uh, discussed in really different contexts. So I think that's really important to distinguish. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then Evelyn. Uh, you are mute. Yes, yes, you're um, Yes, uh, I, I completely agree, by the way, uh, with uh, uh, what Jennifer just said also. We need, uh, we have to um, distinguish categories here also. It's, it's now uh, the topic of looted art or contested heritage has become is becoming broader and broader. This certainly will not also uh, in Europe. Uh, colonial era takings are very, uh, very, very uh, topical, of course, at the moment. So I think we need tools, and I also believe that this is a matter of justice. And I do have a positive feeling that we're we're developing or going towards a a more uh, humanized concept of ownership uh, of cultural property. Thank you so much. Now uh, let's move to uh, Zheng Xin, Professor Huo. Yes. Oh, no. Can you speak? Sorry. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, well, although there are some challenges and obstacles, especially in terms of law to repatriate cultural property between the countries. I believe that this issue should be a, the bridge to build a stronger relationship between the countries instead of the obstacles. For example, as you know that China and the US relationship, China US relationship has some problems nowadays, but even now every year, the US re returned the cultural property uh, pursuant to the bilateral memorandum between China and US. So this case shows that a repatriation of cultural property is a, is a you know, it not an obstacle, but it is a, it's a, the very thing that can link the country together. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Charles, it's your turn. Yeah. These are sensitive uh, cultural, historical, and politicized disputes uh, and others, other areas of the law, these sorts of disputes outside of it can't be inside. Oh, I'm for decided by, by arbitration by ADR. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, any um I think I'm pretty optimistic and I think echoing uh Craig and, and Jennifer. Um I think as somebody who teaches students, uh, postgraduate, undergraduate, I think um, teaching them about the value of uh, the kind of community-based processes, I think is really important going forward and actually um, understanding that, you know, there isn't one size that fits all in terms of repatriation and it's very much 
a local a local community led process and there are going to be differences across the board in terms of how different communities react to different kinds of repatriated materials and that, that, that sometimes that there will be changes in terms of how communities um, perceive different materials across time as well so um, and I think that's something that uh, needs to be recognized in in that process that it isn't just a matter of you know uh, handing museums or cultural institutions archives handing material over it has to each kind of component has to be um, worked through I think is how I would see I would see that going forward into the future thank you so much you know thank you for all the attendees you know you stay throughout this one hour um, 30 minutes discussion also thank you very much for our speakers you know like charles you are five o'clock in, in washington dc you know thank you so much uh i think uh actually the discussion about repatriating of cultured heritage and the exchange between different disciplines should continue and this is the end of our discussion but i hope it will be a beginning of more exchange you know interdisciplinary so thank you very much uh, from university of sydney uh, american society of international law we wish you a very beautiful day bye bye <laughs>